yet another relentless uh, overachiever. We all know Anupama, maybe through her books, maybe through her uh, newspaper articles, maybe through her television show. Anupama, over the last few years, has been one of the key people to define how we look at movies. And Anupama, Anupama was very, very glad to have you with us as well. Thank you so much. एकदम आगे मत आ, फ्रेम में मत आ, बस बाकी तू कुछ जो भी करो। ये खड़ा करा उनको यार। जमी तो जमी तो जमी टूटना नहीं, जमी टूटना नहीं। जावेद भाई, जावेद भाई। क्यों नहीं? मैं भी हो, मैं भी हो। Tulika, would you mind coming and uh, cutting this cake, please? Thanks so much. So I leave it to the two people who are the actual stars of the show. Uh, Anupama, could you say a few words and then we'll uh, back in uh, uh, My whole world is Bollywood and Hollywood. <laughs> I'm like, the corporate land, I don't know anything. But the thing that I really liked about the book was that it's not just about corporate uh, In fact, it's uh, values that we can all use in life. Hai, um, light which is why it's wonderful to have all these young girls here because <laughs> even though this is not a fairy tale, this is very important reading. Uh, it, these are very important lessons. Um, so I really enjoyed reading it and I got very curious about how, Tulika, you first of all connected. Uh, you know, how, does, how did you even think that, okay, corporate connect? really bizarre. I read a lot. So I read three or four books a week. And I read a week, yeah. So at night. And I read everything. So I... Because I, I am. <laughs> and uh, basically I was coming back from a bar with uh, you know some of my colleagues at, at HBS and one of them asked me, what are you reading right now? And I don't know if you remember, but around last year, um, fairy fiction was really in fashion English. And that scene was there and I wanted to impart some lessons and I wanted to leave behind with my teams in Bombay as I was leaving. Um, and I thought, why not do it in the form of fairy tales? So that's how the book came along. Yeah. And one of the lessons I learned during my leadership career was to not treat anyone the same way. Because people are different fundamentally, so they deserve to be treated differently, whether they're male or female. Having said that, women have very different obligations outside the workplace. So, there is a certain characteristic in terms of how we need to balance a lot of priorities, probably more than men. Um, and there are obviously certain unconscious biases that exist in the workplace for women in terms of lack of mentoring um, that can happen because if you are women in senior management roles and unconsciously we tend to mentor people like us, so men get more mentorship. That does happen. I don't think they behave differently. I think at times they may be treated slightly differently. Sometimes really unconsciously. Is that I could emotionally handle the situation because I could never say bye to my team or anything. And I took it out in this book. So what was my darkest period is what's brought me here today. Um, and I think it's all in the mind. You can never control what happens to you. The only control you have is what you do with it. I really live by that. So, does that explain? So, so totally. So, this book comes out of failure. That's amazing. A round of applause, guys. Come on. That's amazing. Now, in, in the book, you put a lot of emphasis on mentors, and you talked about mentors now. Um, how does one actually find out? Because my experience in the media world has been that really nobody has the time. They, they don't care. Nobody, you know, I have never found a mentor when I was reading this, I was like, damn, I would have been way better if I found one. So how do you find one? I mean, I think this was the lesson I learned the hardest. Um, because I confused finding a mentor with politics. I thought finding a mentor was, you know, political play and I was very much lost in it. If I do my job, why should I call anyone, you know, suck up to someone. Yeah, suck up to someone. And that's not it. We are so busy trying to be perfect that we see feedback as a sign of weakness and we don't solicit it. 
and many times, if we look at ourselves, if somebody junior in my industry comes and says, look, I'm going through this problem, can, can I discuss it with you? Because I respect your opinion a lot and I don't know how you dealt with it when you were, you know, my age or at my level. We'd be happy to do it. But when we are young, we never thought about doing it. Even today, there are lots of... I think when you build a network of mentors, it has to be people beside your line manager. Like I go back to the Cinderella story and about her stepmother and stepsisters, it has to be people who are not directly impacted by your success. So for example, I mentor people in other countries that I don't look after. Because I can then give them a point of view which is not directly linked to a selfish agenda. So as a result, it's, um, it's more valuable. I went to my office and said, this person doesn't understand, blah, 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 blah. I wish they would do this. And I always ask them this question, have you gone and told this person exactly in these words what you just told me? No. I said, so if you haven't gone and told them this, how do you expect them to improve or realize that this is what you think? And we end up building all this in our minds and then taking very curious actions. Whereas the cruelest thing you can do to someone is not give them timely, constructive, objective feedback. Um, and if you look at people who are successful, you find a lot of people or the majority of people who are successful are surrounded by successful people. Why? And I, I don't think it's nepotism, I don't think it's because you know they help each other or do each other's homework or whatever else it is. I think it is because they get great feedback and they are demanded to be better because the benchmarks are high. And if we can't get that because maybe we don't have the same sort of level of success all around us, then actually soliciting feedback is a fantastic way to raise that benchmark. That was the so idea. you ask people smarter than yourself? Oh, absolutely. You ask everyone. I think everyone has a point of view. Um, and for everything, you, you know, whether it is about how was the launch today, what do you think I could have done differently? And everybody's opinion counts because it's a point of view. Um, it could be the, you know, the girls have disappeared. You know, um, <laughs> the little girls have run away, it's become too serious. So, um, you know, it could, be, it could be anyone, but it gives you a perspective which is much wider than you would have on your own. So, like, how do you take criticism? Because um, I'm a professional critic and, <laughs> and at times it becomes very uncomfortable and, and I understand. I understand that what I'm saying hurts, it slices, you know, and I've had people react very negatively. Um, so how do you, as a person, learn to actually take that criticism in the right spirit? I think uh, this, uh, this is a chapter about my father in the book. I understand with a calm mind the point of view. I'm not perfect. I feel hurt, feel bad, uh, insecure, sad, you know, all that sort of stuff. But at the end, I really believe that that's the only way you can do better. There's absolutely no other way. And if you're not ready, I think Peter Pan says it, if you're not ready to fall, you, you can't fly. Uh, so it's courage. And we talk about courage in heroes and I think it takes courage to be a leader. It takes courage to be successful. It takes courage to be on television. You know, it takes courage because you're opening yourself up to a lot of positive things but a lot of negativity at the same time. Yeah, it is very negative. I get slammed a lot. Especially when I review Salman Khan film. <laughs> but we I won't really, go there. <laughs> I really like Salman Khan. But that's what I was <laughs> you know, Alice, toward the end, Alice and the rabbit, so she likes Salman Khan. Okay, point to be noted there. <laughs> this perfect woman, this vision of no. <laughs> so Alice and the rabbit find a bottle. And it says that one grows best when one is not lonely. Serving size is for one person only. That's very interesting. Why is it important to grow with other people? You know, I, I've spoken about this book to a number of people and some of them are managers and I've spoken about why as a leader the only job we have is to develop others. That's what we are measured on. And the fact that in middle management you find people who feel insecure about it. So they think that they look good when other people perform but you put them down. You know, you sort of go up by pushing people down. And I get a lot of nervous laughter because this is very idealistic. You know, haha. -ha. That's not how the corporate world works. If somebody comes up more than I will, then they'll outshine me. But if you really look at it, that's our job. 
and at it, that job did demand sacrifice. If you are more senior, you need to be more responsible, more patient, more humble, less angry, less impulsive, listen more, um, and sometimes give up a bit of yourself. So the serving size, one person only is the part of yourself that you give up. Grow. But a majority of people need to find a passion, need to find their own love story in what they're doing. And that passion comes through inspiration from good leadership. Both leading by example, so showing the way, and leading by inspiration, which is where you run harder along the way, are required from good leaders. And then there is the last you know, part of the normal curve, which is people who will not do well because they don't have that innate passion or ambition, whether they are good or bad leadership. So it really then depends on where you fall in that normal curve and how you do it. Some people will always shine, they're like drops of oil, you try to put them in water and squeeze them down and they just pop up. And some people will sink. That's just the way it is. It's just the way it is. Now I ask this question of stars a lot, that once you've attained stardom, does it um, sort of culture a certain, you know, go out and do something totally um, unusual? What does it do when you are in a position of leadership? I mean. Is there pressure to conform or is there pressure to actually, uh, or do you have a certain freedom to take risks? Number one, I wish I was a star. But moving on from that, we need to exercise, but let's imagine it's like your abs, yeah, like your core. So um, I think the, the more you fail and the more you treat it as an opportunity and rebound from it, the more you get a belief that you can get through this and this too shall pass. I mean, one of my favorite sayings I have in my office is, you know, everything will be okay in the end. If it's not okay, it's not the end. And I live by that. So I think as I've become older, I've had bigger failures and they've resulted in bigger successes. And it's just the way it's been. It's been an adventure. So don't be afraid. Exactly. What's been your biggest struggle, Turka, as you ascended this corporate ladder to where you are today? I think I had it slightly different to a lot of women today. I joined, my first job was in mergers and acquisitions in the 90s, um, when it was a real boys club. And I've heard three things in my life, well, all the time. I've heard you're young, you're Indian, you're a woman, as I've worked across the world. And it's been to, for people to stop seeing me as a woman or as young and just see my mind or what I can do. I think that's been the biggest struggle, especially for example in Europe I was managing European men much older than I was, in French which is my third language. Um, How many do you speak? Oh, in India I've heard people spend more time and energy trying to find a smart way of doing things rather than just doing something. In fact, the only way, you know, hard work is a muscle, you have to cultivate it. And the only way you can succeed is to have both perspiration and inspiration. Hard work is a muscle. I'm going to remember that. Yes. <laughs> I'm really going to remember that. Tulika, tell me, when you go out there and you see, you know, men and women, what is the most common mistake that people make as they're trying to? Is it, 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 do we lose sight of other goals or do we... Are we not, like you said, are we trying to take shortcuts? What's like the number one mistake people make? I mean, when I was writing this book, so for me this book was written like a movie. Uh, so it just happened and then sometimes I had to pause and think, okay, where did that come from? And, you know, it was just like a diary, I guess. Um, and there's a, there's a chapter on this teacup and saucer. And he says, you know, I'm a cup full of tea, am I half empty? Uh, half of tea and am I half empty or am I half full? And I think that's the biggest mistake people make. When they are faced with a challenge, they get by 